Hi everyone, this is Sam Black with Drafting Archetypes, and this week we are going to talk about Double Feature, and I have been drafting it a good amount the last couple days, and I'd say struggling a little bit initially, and I think that I have a good handle on why that is. So, first of all, general business. There are no notes this week. Uh, this is all really just off the top of my head. And also, this isn't going to be really focusing on a single archetype because this is the only episode that we'll be doing about double feature. Next week, I believe we'll be ready to get into looking at uh, the new Kamigawa set. So I'm going to try to cover an overview of double feature, some of the stuff I've learned, uh, some of the things that are significantly different from the previous two sets, stuff like that. So I mentioned that I've been not having great success in the format. And the reason is that all else equal, I uh, really prefer to draft decks that play very long games. And while I have found blue, car blue to be open and blue cards to be good, I would say that initially I was pushing toward uh, splashing and playing more colors because at the end of Midnight Hunt, I really enjoyed the Eccentric Farmer decks, and I was optimistic about the role of that card and Jack Lantern to let me splash the abundant bombs that exist. I guess some housekeeping for anyone who isn't familiar with the format. Um, in double feature, there are twice as many rares. Every pack has two rares. So you see a lot more bombs in the set. So it's nice to be able to take advantage of some of those. A thing that you can do to help do that is to play more colors so that you can splash more bombs. That was kind of my starting point. And uh, my first deck was felt pretty good, but I currently don't believe that if your goal is to win the draft, that should be your general approach. I think that this format is pretty aggressive and that two color decks are generally favored. I think the fixing is not great. Uh, there aren't enough farmers to do like green based fixing and Weaver of Blossoms, I guess, kind of steps in to help out with uh, the farmers. But overall, it's just that doesn't allow some of the synergies that the farmer decks had, uh, specifically like combining the density of farmers and jack-o'-lanterns. You can't really do that stuff. There are just fewer flashback cards than there were in Midnight Hunt with less self-mill, less mana fixing out of your graveyard. That that, like, that Midnight Hunt uh, multicolor deck just isn't really available in this format. The other issue that you run into if you're trying to do green-based multicolor is that green is the worst color in the format by a considerable margin. Green hasn't been good independently in either of these sets, and uh, together it's still not good. Most of its synergies with the various different color pairs aren't well supported, or like it's doing different things with some of the pairs across the two different sets, or not really having much of a theme, like green, black, and Midnight Hunt just wasn't doing much and green blue the decks are kind of different and green red it just isn't good in midnight hunt green white isn't good in vow it it's very green is just not in a great spot my current belief is that you want to be a proactive low curve two color deck that avoids green i think white uh based on the early stats seems to be the strongest color or the winningest color I don't know that I think that white is the strongest color. I think that a lot of what's happening is players are trying stuff out and adjusting to how this format's different from the previous two formats and all of that. And I think the white cards kind of skew a little toward playing an aggressive deck that plays well in the format. I think that once people have a better handle on how to use the other decks, I expect the win rate of the white decks to drop off a little bit. Uh, I still think white's good. I think that the white cards play reasonably well across the two sets and they're strong and everything. I just am not really convinced that like white is, you know, the best color in the format or something. Early results have Boros with the highest win rates. 
Notably, red was a great color in Vow and a bad color in Midnight Hunt. Um, it turns out those balance out to it's fine. And it's notable that on Arena, there are only three uncommons in packs, while in Paper and Magic Online, there are four. Um, there are two uncommons from each set. The higher density, I believe, would favor Boros because of the strength of the Midnight Hunt uh, Boros cards. Um, just seeing more of those is going to help the archetype. But it's been doing well on Arena even without that bonus. So Boros is good, largely because I think just being aggressive is good. And unlike in Midnight Hunt, the colors aren't independently bad and all that. If you're just generally avoiding green, like... Boros versus Demir. Boros is the much more aggressive deck in general. And so that's the space you want to be gravitating toward. Featured numbers wise, it's notable that in Vow, the two mana creatures basically all had two power. And that meant that the two three creatures for three were all very good at uh, shutting down your opponent's two drops, which led to aggressive decks not having very good performances. Like the, the, all the two mana cards didn't do well in aggressive decks because they all had two power. And so everyone was playing two threes for three to block them. In Midnight Hunt, there are a lot of three ones for two. And the t uh, two threes that existed in Midnight Hunt, like Shady Traveler, had really bad win rates in Midnight Hunt because they were trading down rather than breaking all the twos. So in the format with two power creatures, like two twos into two threes, the two threes did well and the two twos did badly. In the format with three ones into two threes, the three ones were okay and the two threes were bad. We combine those form formats and now the two threes are bad, uh, which means that the two twos are probably a little bit better and the three ones are fine. But basically, you shouldn't expect random two threes to be as good as they were in Vow. So cards like Kindly Ancestor are performing worse. And uh, that also makes sense because there are fewer life gain synergies because the black-white life gain theme that existed in Vow isn't what Midnight Hunt was about. Midnight Hunt was about a sacrifice theme that doesn't really care about Kindly Ancestor. On that note, exploit plays really, really well because you have the decayed zombie tokens as additional fodder and you have the sacrifice stuff that was part of the black-white game plan slash the blue-black game plan to some extent with um, like Eaten Alive and Ecstatic Awakener as good ways to sacrifice the cards that want to be sacrificed like the butler and the egg from Vow, and the Decayed Zombie tokens just make all of the exploit creatures much, much better. Well, I shouldn't say all of them, uh, because they're a bit of a double-edged sword with the 5-2 that makes your opponent sacrifice, or the 5-4 that makes your opponent sacrifice a creature, because they might have their own Decayed Zombies to sacrifice. But the other Decayed creatures, you're much more likely to be able to just can sacrifice a Decayed token, giving up basically nothing, and getting their trigger. So... Stitched Assistant and Repository Scab in particular are way better now. And the fact that they exist makes both good sources of zombies, especially Startle, a lot better. Was already great, is now even better. And also makes anything that bounces your own creatures better. Because you can, you know, if nothing else, bounce an exploit creature and use the exploit again. Which is especially important with Geist Wave in particular, because two mana to pick up your creature and draw a card is really powerful when you're getting another exploit use out of it. I really like what's going on in that space. Blue-Red, very unsurprisingly, plays really well. There's a lot of synergy there because both sets, Blue-Red was about doing the same thing fundamentally. They were both like non-creature spells in some capacity, matters, play a bunch of that stuff. And now the exploit stuff that you couldn't really use well in a lot of blue-red decks, sometimes you could if you got Epicures and Lantern Bearers, 
but there was not a lot of fodder available in Blue Red. And now uh, with the addition of Flip the Switch and Revenge of the Drown and Startle, it's a lot easier to include the exploit creatures in your Blue Red decks. Incidentally, ha- being able to play prioritize exploit creatures more highly in Blue Red means that you're more likely to have more sacrifice outlets, though notably that's you know somewhat countered by the fact that there just are fewer exploit creatures in the pack. But if you are willing to go into three color, I have seen, I think, um, a little bit more. It feels like it's a little bit easier, all things considered, for a like steal and sack strategy to come together in this format. Still pretty hard just because there aren't like free sack outlets that just hang around and wait for you to use a threaten. But there are a decent number of ways to sacrifice your opponent's creature and there is a threatened type effect, a betrayal in each set. That's something to keep an eye on more than something to really look for. Big picture wise, that's basically it. I, I would plan to heavily avoid green across the board. I think every two color pair that isn't green is pretty good. And I don't think there are very big differences in how good they are. Blue-white plays really well. I think that a lesson that I was learning about blue-white more concretely toward the end of Vow is that I I had some blue-white decks that looked pretty good. They were like low curve, pretty proactive, full of good cards, and they struggled due to flooding out because they didn't have enough card draw. I was feeling like card draw was really important in blue-white toward the end of Vow, and I think that that's going to continue to be true in this format, but I don't think that it's very hard to uh, make sure that you have some ways to draw cards. And I think that all the graveyard synergies with the exploit synergies, that all works well together. Oh, blood. I should talk about blood a little bit. I think everything that gives you blood is considerably better now, unless it's something that also needs to use blood to do something. But like there's less blood, so blood synergies are less powerful, but they're diminishing returns on looting. And so each individual blood matters more than it does in just Vow. A cute synergy that I had um, in my last deck was I, I had the Shipwreck Sifter, Uh, which grows and you discard a spirit. And so if you make blood and then discard the spirit to the blood, you can grow your Shipwreck Sifter. And in Midnight Hunt, it was generally pretty hard to grow Shipwreck Sifters except with more of them. But the blood, if you end up in a deck that has both blood and a good density of spirit or just dirt cards, uh, it can be easier to grow the Shipwreck Sifter, which... It's pretty small because it's hard to get a lot of blood and blue-white, but cute thing to look for that increases the value of the siphon if you are in that space. So black-white, I think it's fine, but low synergy. I think that white and black are both independently good, but the synergies that existed in the two sets were pretty minor and not the same. And so you're really just, I think looking for raw card quality in your black-white decks more than Synergy, which had kind of already been true and continues to be true. Black-red is strong, but you want to lean toward playing more Vowed cards than Midnight Hunt cards, supported with like the good removal from Midnight Hunt. And the black-red, the Socialite is great, and Florian is uh, one of the best rares. But... There were a lot of not very good vampires in Midnight Hunt that were trying to do the like aggro thing to like push damage, but just weren't very good, like the perforator and stuff that I still don't think are particularly good now. Because there are more rares, and if you're playing in paper, more uncommons, it's easier to not play the like weakest portion of the commons. And so I think that if you're black red and you can just not have to play the like bad Midnight Hunt commons, you should have a pretty good deck. And... Yeah, blue-red's great, red-white's great. I guess what I'll say about green is I think that green-blue is where I would want to be if I were green, but it's not. I I think green-white was maybe the winningest green archetype. Yeah, green-white was the winningest green archetype. 
If I'm green, I'm probably trying to do weird splashing stuff with it. Notably, Winterthorn Blessing has a really incredible win rate. Like, it's the sixth highest in the set right now in 17 lands, so above basically every great mythic and rare. Um, in fact, it has a higher win rate than every single mythic, which maybe the mythics don't have a large enough sample size yet to have win rates, which would potentially explain that. That seems like what's probably happening. I, I can't think of anything else that would make any sense there. So let's ignore that. Anyway, Winterthorn Blessing is good, but the rest of the deck is not very good. So I guess I would see Winterthorn Blessing as potentially a reason to go into blue-green, try to be proactive, but really, uh, I don't know. Avoid green if you can. I am really rambling at this point, so... I'm going to turn this over to questions from chat. Ordinarily, this would be where I would thank my newest patrons on patreon.com slash drafting archetypes, but I haven't prepared for this podcast outside of just playing games, and so I haven't checked who to thank, so I'll do all that um, next week when I'm talking about Kamigawa. All right, first note from chat. I felt like combat math was a thing I did more in Midnight Hunt than in Vow. And in Double Feature, it's felt more like Midnight Hunt. So by doing combat math, I'm guessing that means like checking to see if you have lethal, meaning that it's more about like a race, whereas if it's like board control and like you just your opponent's out of stuff and you have more stuff and you're just winning easily, you don't have to do as much combat math. It's certainly the case that decayed zombies just fundamentally lead to a lot more. I have to think about like what's happening here just in terms of like, oh, how much can you crack back for? As far as like the difference, I would say the concept is a little fuzzy and my experience hasn't been enough drafting the right kind of decks to have a great sense of that. But I will say when I was playing like blue, white, kind of like flying aggro spirit deck there were definitely some games that were came down to you know the race of like my flyers against my opponent's ground creatures and figuring out like how much i had to hit them for versus jump block and stuff like that how far does avoiding green go would you take galvanic iteration over consuming blob pack one pick one well i don't think galvanic iteration is a particularly high priority so i would not do that it's hard to imagine a pack where galvanic iteration would be the second card I would take, but I might be underrating it, but I would be willing to first pick a consuming blob. So it doesn't go so far that I'm going to decline green's, uh, you know, top five mythics or whatever, but I'm going to try to avoid it's, you know, not go into green for like a good common or uncommon, basically. Midnight hunt commons are on average better than Vow, so I'd expect double to feel more like midnight hunt than Vow because the uh, midnight hunt cards get cut less also question mark do packs have more midnight hunt cards than vow cards five commons of midnight hunt versus four commons of vow if that's true i haven't noticed it and haven't heard about it but it certainly could be true and interesting when i thought about this before it was when i like when i thought there were four uncommons which would significantly change the texture of the format in terms of just like the commons would matter less and it would be more about the uncommons when that's not true the commons ma- still matter about as much as they do in the individual sets, minus a little bit for the rares. I do think that it's going to mostly come down to, I don't think it's going to come down to average quality so much as like which commons are the loudest in terms of their impact on gameplay. And certainly like the quality of the top commons route and the quality of like all the commons. Yeah, I, I don't know to what extent I agree with the claim that the Midnight Hunt commons are just like better overall at the top. I think it, you know, varies from color to color. And there's stuff like, yes, Organ Hoarder is, you know, better than Bow's commons, but like Organ Hoarder is much closer to Stitched Assistant when they're together than they were in different formats because Stitched Assistant gains so much by being with the Decayed Zombies. So it's actually kind of like only marginally worse. So I'm not sure about that. I think the texture is in the middle and different, um, but I have felt like Midnight Hunt 
was very aggressive and proactive and like counter spells are a lot worse in Midnight Hunt than in Vow. Well, Flip the Switch was good, but still felt like overall countering things like Dissipate seemed like it would be better in Vow than in Midnight Hunt. Yeah, I, I'm not totally sure how to evaluate that is what I'm really getting at. Do I think Gift of Fangs is better or worse now? My inclination is worse but I could be wrong about that. The reason my inclination is worse is that it was already a weak removal spell in Vow and Midnight Hunt has better removal than Vow does. Uh, the reason I could be wrong about it is aggressive decks are better. It's a cheap removal spell that's good against like two drops and the two drops are better probably when you combine the sets uh, because like, you know, the thing that I was saying about the three ones kind of pushing out two threes making room for both the three ones and the two twos to see play more. But I think that ultimately that's still not that important. Gift of Fangs is still bad against both vampires and spirits, and there's just better removal. Note that uh, because the format's faster, looping your deck would be weaker than it was in Vow, even with the addition of Devious Cover-Up, which I mostly agree with. Devious cover-up was really bad in Midnight Hunt. I think that it's more playable in this format. And I think that there, because the removal's better, it is possible to have decks that loop and do it well and are strong. But I agree that overall it's harder to do it uh, in this format than it was in Vow. Question about my top three uncommons to take first pick, first pack, which I'm not going to be able to think of easily offhand. So I'm going to pull up the stats and think about what I, you know, agree with and what sounds good. And I'm going to say my top three are probably Brian Comer, Diver Scab, and Bioloom Egg, which are three of the top five uh, by win rate right now, skipping Winterthorn Blessing, which has the highest win rate among uncommons, but puts you in green and skipping foul play because I prefer blue to black. To what extent did I notice the rarity distribution change? Are there concerns with mucking around with uh, that distribution that overcome what you'd see in a normal draft? It just The set definitely feels like it has more rares. I had a deck with just like a ton of them. I, I lost count. I had a lot. And you play against more rares. The like twice as many rares is very notable. As far as like the other rarity distribution change, since there aren't more uncommons on Arena, I haven't been feeling it on Arena. It can't be felt on Arena. As far as like the impact, I think this format is considerably less about like Hullbreaker Horror and Dreadfast Demon type rares than Vow is, because there are better answers and the format's faster. And so the expensive rares are like winning fewer games, but I guess it's more like the first rare to stick rather than like the biggest rare or whatever. I think that like the rares are strong and can end games, but it's, it feels like, you know, kind of like constructed where the decks are just more powerful. So the game games end faster rather than like, oh, it's all about like the single bomb. Well, basically, I think that the I think the primary effect of twice as many rares is that it drives down the game length on average because it's just more likely that someone sticks so like three or four mana bomb and the game just ends. I do think that, you know, you want to prioritize removal to answer the bombs that exist in both sets and everything because there are so many, not just in terms of like what portion of the rares are good relative to other sets, but just twice as many rares are open. So there are a lot of rares. But I do think that the... Primary effect is to make games shorter, which makes the expensive bears less good than they are normally. Which is not to say that you shouldn't be taking and playing the expensive bears, just that fewer games are going to come down to them. Shouldn't you be lower on Comer and Double Feature now that there are fewer uh, good ways to enchant things? It still has a 66.6% .6 win rate right now, just in terms of the stats and results and the like going wide is still just great. It might be worse than it would be if there was a higher density of spells, but it's just really strong and plays well with the cards that exist anyway. Training is overcosted in general, true, but are there a couple training cards with decent, but there are a couple training cards with decent stats. 
and some with typically terrible stats. Any thoughts on why some like Griff Rider can shine? So yeah, Griff Rider currently has really good stats. I assume that that's more about flying than about training. With Griff Rider being good, something to pay attention to is Neonate's Rush, which is a card that always did pretty well that I'm very high on. Um, I think there are a lot of good one toughness creatures to kill, and Griff Rider is high among them. Notably, its stats aren't great right now, and particularly notably, they're currently below Belligerent Guest, which is a card that didn't have good stats in its format, whereas uh, Neonate's Rush did have good stats in its format. Also, while wow, looking at red stats, Blood Petal Celebrant, another card that really failed in its format, has the second highest win rate on Arena right now. Again, this is early, sample sizes are small, aggressive decks are doing well, Blood Petal Celebrant is likely to be played in aggressive decks. But I think that Blood Petal Celebrant really speaks to what I was saying about how two threes are weaker and kind of pushed out by the existence of the three ones, and that that lets the two power creatures shine more than they were otherwise. Uh, going back to the Griff Rider question, I, I, I really I don't think that there's a lot to say about training there outside of just like, well, you know, there are, I guess, like with Griff Rider in particular, the existence of three power two drops is a really big deal, right? Like if all the two power creatures have, if all the two mana creatures have two power, then they're not ready to train your Griff Rider when you attack on turn four. Whereas if there are three twos, then they can, which is a significant difference. But mostly I think it's just about the flyer. Next question, Ceremonial Knife still has bad stats, shocker. Are there any decks that uh, should want to play it since the blood tokens are better than it was? I'm sure it's fine to play in some Boros decks that have a particularly low curve and have creatures that, you know, use having the one extra power is a big deal. As usual, you know, when in doubt, don't play it. But if your deck uses equipment really well, you can. You need to both use equipment well and use blood well. Doing one or the other of those things isn't enough, but I doubt it's strictly unplayable, but it will be played far more than it should be. So you probably want to be the person who's generally not playing it. Red has some similar cards at common. Flame Breather versus Crasher slash versus Braid. Do I have favorites in both examples? A Braid is a much better card than Moonrager slash. Red's not good enough. You don't. There aren't a lot of cards that you want to play that start the day-night cycle, and you don't really have enough control over like whether the day-night cycle is going to be there. I think that Slash costs three a much larger portion of the time than it costs one. So if you want to think about it in terms of like you know averaging its cost overall or something, it costs more than two on average. Also, when it costs one, you can rarely take advantage of it because it doesn't cost one until late. Also, I think... The big advantage of Moonrager Slash is that it can hit your opponent, but I think being able to hit an artifact with a braid is not nothing. It's possible that like three to any target is better than three to a creature or kill an artifact in this format, but a braid is appreciably easier to cast in a way that matters more. As for Flame Breather versus Crasher, that's an interesting one. I think they play in slightly different decks. Crasher obviously has the much higher ceiling and damage output, and Flame Breather just like you know, you don't need to be able to attack. Crasher has uh, better stats overall at the moment, like about a percent better. And I think I'm inclined to trust that, even though Flame Breather kind of, I don't know, speaks to me a little bit more. But it would appear that, you know, the high risk, high reward Flame Crasher output performs better. For white, Lunark Veteran and Traveling Minister would both stand out white one drops of their formats. Veteran has better stats, but is, is it actually better or just going in better decks? I think the like implied two for one is a really big deal, especially in a format that has three ones that people are playing and like successful aggressive decks and you know cards like Neonate's Rush that are preying on one toughness creatures. I think that just being able to block with Lunark Veteran, trade with something, and then get the body back, it makes sense to me that it would perform better than Minister. Minister is really good as a like repeated life gain enabler, which Veteran's mostly covering and matters less now, and as a way to like push creatures through, let them attack where they couldn't otherwise, which was important both with training and really, really good in a world full of two threes, 
because it both let your two two twos and your two threes attack into your opponent's two threes. But I think that combat in this format is just such that you have available attacks in general more often. So it's less likely that the traveling minister is giving you an attack that you didn't otherwise have. So its ability is less important. So that that would be my guess as to what's going on with veteran performing better than minister. But it's all pretty theoretical and largely, you know, explaining, like looking at the numbers we have and explaining them rather than predicting the results. And the numbers are yeah, Lunark veterans performed almost a percent better, but again, small sample sizes and everything. Which are you picking higher, a braid or flame blast bolts? Uh, a braid. It wins more, and I, I guess I feel better about it being like, like it does something to more cards, whereas like flame blast bolt has like a higher ceiling. Like exiling something that matters to exile, spending less mana to do it is a much like bigger tempo swing, but. You know, it's like there's the binary output on like does nothing to a three toughness creature versus kills it. Like there are more cards where a braid does something, more cards where flame blast bolts a blah, but I, I would rather just have like the wider range of impact over the higher ceiling of impact. If they're like comparable overall power level, it just feels like a safer hedge. And also on top of that, a braid wins more. Lower on the Vow pacifism now that exploit got better. So that's an interesting question because like, so Candle Trap existed and was horrible in Midnight Hunt. And I was low on imprisonment, but it actually played pretty well in Vow. And so the question is with both of those cards, are they both bad now? Or is it still like somehow Candle Trap is bad and imprisonment's good? And I don't quite have the depth of experience to feel confident one way or another, but I think that my guess would be aggressive decks still like imprisonment and don't like candle trap. Defensive decks should maybe be a little bit lower on both, depending on how good they are. Like, the better you are, the more you just want to buy the time and you can afford to get like kind of like got a little bit if your opponent can get value out of the thing that you used it on. Especially, you know, if the people you're playing against are generally the aggressor and you have enough ability. I, I think that they're both probably, I think that Candle Trap is probably a little bit better than it was in its format. And um, Imprisonment is probably a little bit worse, but Imprisonment is still better overall use some caution when playing and prioritizing them, but I would guess imprisonment's fine. Yeah, similar situation with Locked in a Cemetery, where its stats aren't horrible. They're not good, but they're better than Midnight Hunt. I agree with that. And I, yeah, I think that it and Candle Trap are both improved. And yes, the density of exploit cards is lower. Is Blue still underdrafted relative to its power like in Vow? It didn't feel like, yes, I wanted to draft Blue and it didn't feel hard to get Blue cards. And... I wouldn't say that I had that experience with like everything due to just like cards being strong across the board or whatever. Like there was a draft where I started with Anya and really couldn't get into black red. Like I just wasn't getting past black or red cards and got pushed into blue. Whereas I've comfortably been blue in almost all my drafts. So I think I would say blue is still underdrafted relative to its power level. All right, I'm going to wrap this up. Apologies for this one being a little scattered and rambly. Felt like it was getting uh, far enough into the short window of double feature being available on Arena um, that I felt like I really wanted to put something out. And like I said, I was kind of struggling early, so I wanted time to get a handle on why and what was going on. That meant that I haven't had a lot of time to like prepare, but I hope that I've had enough time to like figure out some useful stuff and convey it. Um, I will be back to my normal higher level of planning and structure as we get into Neon Dynasty. Thanks for uh, bearing with me, and I'll be back sometime next week. Again, not at my usual time because uh, Neon Dynasty won't be ready on uh, next day. That's all.